Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson on mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to be moving on to exponential and logarithmic, logarithmic functions. Um, the reason we're doing this is because if you've been following the lessons, you will see that we've actually been doing inverse functions and exponentials and log logarithmic functions are inverse of each other. So in order to really understand what's going on, we need to actually understand this. So let's get started straight away. And when I say functions, I don't just mean graphs, I mean functions. In other words, everything to do with it. So let's get going. First of all, you need to know your rules. So anything to the zero is one. And that is an important rule. Anything to the zero is one. A to the M times A to the N is equal to A to the M plus N. An example of this would be if I had, well, let me prove it to you. If I had A cubed and A to the four, that would be the same as saying A times A times A. And A to the four would be A times A times A times A. And if I add them up, you will see that there are seven. So that becomes A to the seven. So therefore we can say that a to the m times a to the n is equal to the a to the m plus n. So when you multiply two exponents and they have the same base, we add their exponents. a to the m to the n is equal to the a to the mn. So what we're saying is, what I like to say is you multiply across the black brackets. That's what you're really doing, you're multiplying across the brackets. But again, let me prove this to you. If we've got a squared, cubed, do you agree that's the same as a squared times a squared times a squared? It is that whole a squared multiplied by itself three times. And then we've just proven using that rule here that when we multiply something, what do we do the exponents? We add them. So if we do that, that becomes a to the 2 plus 2 plus 2 which is a to the 6, which is exactly the same as if I had gone a to the 2 times 3. So if you have anything to the power, which is then in turn made to the power of something, then you just multiply it across the brackets. Okay, similarly, if you have a, b all to the power of n, then that is exactly the same as a to the n times by b to the n. Okay, and we're doing exactly the same thing there. What we we're saying is, let's imply, okay, let's give you an example. It's much easier if I give you an example. Let's say I've got a cubed b squared all to the power of four. Okay, so what did we say? We said it was the same. We've just said it's the same as multiplying across the brackets, okay? So do you agree that is the same as saying a to the three times four b to the 2 times 4, which is the same as saying a to the 12, b to the 8, okay? What was happening here was that the exponent of a was 1 and the exponent of b was 1. So what you were missing here was a 1 times by n and a 1 times by n over here. I can prove it to you another way. Let's say I do it the way we did it here. This would have become a cubed b squared a cubed b squared, a cubed b squared, a cubed b squared, which is effectively a cubed times a cubed times a cubed times a cubed, do you agree? So it's a to the 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 times up b, 1, 2, 3, 4, so it's b squared plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, because you've got common bases, which are multiplied together, you add the exponents, we've said that, so it becomes a to the 12, b to the 8, there you go a to 12, b to the 8. Okay, let's carry on. Now we're applying exactly the same rule, but to the division, okay, or the quotient. In this case, if you have a division and you've got common bases, then you subtract the exponents. And again, I'm going to do an example just to prove it to you. If you've got a to the 6 divided by a to the 4, do you agree I could write it as a times a times a times a times a times a? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. All over 
a times a times a times a and now what I can do is I can cancel I can say this divided into that is one this divided into this one is one this divided into this one is one and this divided into this one is one and what am I left with I'm left with a squared which would be exactly the same as if I'd subtracted these two so if you're dividing you subtract the exponents Okay, now this rule here is identical to the previous rule where we said that a b to the n is equal to a to the n b to the n. It really doesn't matter what you're doing in the bracket, you're applying this n to everything inside it. So if I've got a squared over b cubed all to the power of 2, that is exactly the same as saying a squared over b squared times by a squared over b squared, right? Sorry, that's a cube, cube, cube. And what do you do when you are multiplying bases? I mean, exponents to the same bases, you add the exponents. So that becomes a to the two plus two is four, over b to the three plus three is six, that's b to the six. And if you think about it this way, this would be exactly the same. If I'd gone a to the two times two, 2 over b to the 3 times 2, do you agree that we can give me a to the 4 over b to the 6? So that rule actually stands. Now, this is just a little bit of an extension of what you already know. You know that a to the minus 1 is 1 over a, where the minus actually tells you that you need to go on the other side of the divide by line and the 1 tells you the power of 1. So it's a to the minus 2 is going to be 1 over a squared. a to the minus 3 is 1 over a cubed. And also, very importantly, if I give you 1 over a to the minus 1, remember this minus just tells you that you're going the other side of the quotient line. So that becomes a to the 1 over 1 which is just a. Okay, so now if we look at this, we've got exactly the same thing going on here, except instead of a 1, 2, or 3, they've got an n. So if I separated this out, I could separate this out as to being a to the minus n times by 1 over b. Do you agree? Which could then be written as 1 over a to the n times by 1 over b, which is then 1 over a to the n b. There you go. And that's how you get that. Similarly, if I write this out, I could have written this out as a times by 1 over b b to the minus n, but we've just shown that the rule says the minus means that we're taking across to the other side of the quotient line, and that's the power of the b, that's the exponent. So this becomes a times b to the n, which is just a b to the n, and you really don't have to write over 1, it's implied. Okay, now if you've got all of this a over b all to the power of minus n. Remember the rule is whatever this is, it applies to everything in the bracket, okay? So that becomes a to the minus n over b to the minus n. But agree, do you agree you can actually again split this up? You could write this as a to the minus n over 1 times a 1 over b to the minus n. And I can hear you guys say, oh, but you just said don't have to write a, a 1 yet. Yes, that's fine, but that's your final answer. When I'm trying to work out what's going on and I need to take something over the quotient line, I need a quotient line, okay? So I'm putting it in. So this minus tells me it has to go to the other side of this divide line, the quotient line, and it's going to be to the power of n. And this minus tells me it's going to the other side. So the b is going to go up and the a is going to go down. So this becomes 1 over a to the n times our b to the n over 1. And then if we join them together, it becomes b to the n over a to the n, which do you agree then I could actually, if I really wanted to, I could write as b over a all to the power of n. And I'm not saying I want to, I'm just showing you what you could do. Right, so the whole point about this is that the exponents of logs are inverse of each other. And what we've already said is that if you've got x equals a to the y, 
then you to get the inverse we swap the x and y and we solve for y so the equation is y equals log x base a and Remember I told you it's a silly example, but it really works for me. And I find that when I tell my students it seems to work for them as well. If I give you two to three equals eight, if you translate that, it becomes log eight base two equals three. Now, you guys don't need to know the log rules anymore, but a lot of my students have learned the log rules. So that is easy for them because this is log two cubed base two, okay? The rule is that the three goes to the front, so that becomes three, log two base two, that cancels and then there, that's three. So that makes sense to them and that's why I teach it, okay? But more importantly, it helps, it's a little bit easier to understand than X and A's and Y's. Okay, but the whole point is that the two states is a base and the eight and three to swap places. Okay, that might be a better way for you guys to remember. But effectively what's happening is X and Y are swapping places okay x and y are swapping and then you're solving for y but now therefore since the exponents and the logs are inverse of each other and because they say even though they say you don't need to know the log rules i'm going to go through them anyway because it really does give you some insight as to what to do when you get exponential and log equations okay so the rule is log a b base b is equal to log a plus log b or base b. The original rule that they used to teach was that log a b is equal to log a plus log b. Okay, so what they're saying is that if you've got a log of two numbers that you multiply together, it becomes log a plus log b. They're suddenly putting in this little b here now. Okay, because a lot of students struggle to realize that if there was no B, then it implied that this was a base 10. Okay, that this is base 10. Now what they're saying to you by putting the B in is they're saying that this could be any base, but it's going to be the end of the same base. So in other words, I could say log of two, uh, three times four, is going to be log 3 base 2 plus log 4 base 2. So it stays, it keeps the same base and then it splits up into an addition sum. Similarly, if you're dividing, it becomes minus. See how there's a little bit of a, um, a similarity here between the exponents and the logs, where this is multiplication becomes addition and division becomes subtraction. So it's exactly the same thing, but this time you are minusing, but this keeps the same bases. Now, this I've actually just used, okay? The law says that the log of, say, 3 squared okay, is equal to, what happens is this 2 goes to the front and it becomes 2 log 3. Also, this one we use quite often. If you have a log, I don't know, 5 base 3, that can be written as log 5 over log 3. And that's an important one because sometimes, especially in finance, you might have a expression that says log 5 base 3 is equal to x and if you've got your calculator and your calculator happens to have this type of log in it okay then that's awesome then you can just put in the numbers 3 and 5 and get the equation however a lot of people's calculators don't have this they've just got the basic log in which case you need to know that you can convert this log 5 base 3 into a log 5 divided by log 3 and then put it in your calculator. And look, finally, log a base a equals 1. In other words, log of anything, where it be base 6, base 6 is equal to 1. And that makes sense because if we rearrange it, this becomes 6 to 1 is equal to 6. Okay, because it works like that. It goes that to the power of that is equal to that. Okay, so in other words, if I've got log 8 base 2 equals y, I've got 2 to the power of y equals 8. 2 to the power of y equals 8. It makes like a little circle. Okay, so now, now that we know that, 
it can maybe be a little bit easier when we have to do exponential graphs and functions and solve equations. Okay, like if they want us to prove or show where an exponential graph and a log graph cut. Okay, so before we do any of that, let's look at the inverse of an exponential graph example. So it says draw the following graph stating its domain and range, and you've got y is equal to 2 to the power of x. And the only way you can really do these graphs effectively is actually to plot points. So what we're going to do is we're going to go x and we're going to go y and we're going to go minus 1, what, 0, 1, 2. Okay, so if x is minus 1, y is a half. If x is naught, y is 1. If x is 1, y is 2. And if x is 2, y is 4. Okay, so if x is minus 1, y is a half. If x is naught, y is 1. I'm actually going to yeah, put little crosses simply because then my pen won't do funny things. If x is 1, y is 2. And if x is 2, y is 4. Okay, so there's our graph. Okay, so that's our exponential graph. Okay, always cuts at one unless we do something to it. You will note that the asymptote is the x-axis. Y equals zero is the asymptote. That is asymptote, okay? Now, let's talk about the domain and range. The domain of this is going to be all the values that work for the x-axis. So it's actually going to be from minus infinity to positive infinity. Do you cross the x-axis? It'll carry on going forever and ever and ever. Never quite touches the y-axis. I mean, the x-axis, but it goes on. And it goes on and on and on forever. So the domain is x is an element of real numbers. The range, however, is y is an element of real numbers, but y is going to be greater than zero. It isn't going to be equal to zero because the asymptote is the y-axis. It is going to be greater. Right, now we need to draw the inverse function and state its domain and range. Okay, so do you agree by state don't join the inverse function? We could actually just swap the x and y values. That's what we could do. We could just do that. So in other words, when y equals minus one, x equals a half. Okay, when y equals minus one, x equals a half, right? When y is zero, when y is zero, x is one. Okay. When y is one, x is two. And when y is two, y is two, x is four. And it looks like this. Okay. So that day, it just said draw. It didn't say work out its formula equation. That there is the inverse. Okay, and you will notice again this time that the x equals zero is your asymptote. And this time the domain, the domain is going to be that x is an element of real numbers for x is greater than zero. So it's all the values from there upwards. The range is going to be y is an element of real numbers all the way from minus infinity to positive infinity okay happy okay now now they've asked us again to draw the following graph of y is equal to x half the power of x okay so again the best way to draw these gra graphs is actually to plot the points okay but i'd like to point something out um, first of all, this is x and this is y. Do you agree that this y is equal to half to the power of x? So do you agree that that is the same as saying 2 to the negative 1 to the power of x, which is going to be 2 to the negative x? Okay, so that is what we're actually plotting into. y is equal to 2 to the negative x. So our values are, we're going to try minus 2, minus 1, sorry, it's 2, 0, 1, and 2. And we're going to substitute into this value here just to make it a little bit easier for us to do it. Okay, so if we do this, okay, it becomes 2 to the minus minus 2, which is 2 to the 2, which is 4. 
okay? 2 to the minus minus 1 is 2 to the 1, which is just 2. 2 to the 0 is 1. This is a half and this is a quarter because 2 to the minus 2. 2 to the minus 2 is 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 over 4. Okay, that's a quarter. So let's now plot this. So when x is minus 2, y is 4. When x is minus 1, y is 2. When x is 0, y is 1. When x is 1, y is a half. Okay, and you get the gist. So it actually looks like this. Okay, and it's supposed to never touch the axes again. And if I raise it, it's going to raise the whole line. No. Okay. So it's going to join like that. Okay. And you will notice again that our asymptote is the y equals zero line. There is your asymptote. So the domain for this is going to be, the domain for this is going to be from minus infinity to positive infinity, do you agree? Because it stretches all the way across the negative side and it stretches all the way across the positive. So the domain is x is an element of real values. The range, however, is still going to be y is an element of real values, but y is going to be greater than zero. Okay. Now it says draw the inverse function. So again, they don't want us to work out the equation. They just want us to draw it. So again, when are we doing when y equals minus 2, x equals 4? Okay, or a better way to do this, when x equals 4, y equals minus 2. When x equals 2, y equals minus 1. When x equals 0, y equals 1. Okay, let's try again. No, when x equals 0, y is 1. No, I am doing this wrong. <gasps> Sorry, guys. Let's just do this again properly. Okay, let's do it the other way. Da, 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 da. Okay, when, now we're doing that this is y and this is x. Okay, so when x is 4, y is minus 2. 1, 2. That's right. When x equals 2, y is minus 1. Perfectly correct. When x equals 0, y, y is 1. Mm -hmm, I thought so. When x is, um, when x is a half, when x is, oh, when x is 1, oh, I can't believe I'm getting this wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, let's try again. Uh, oh. Blonde day, I swear to goodness, it's a blonde day. Okay, let's try again. Sorry. When x is, <laughs> when x is 1, y is 0. When x is a half, y is a quarter. And there we go. And there we go. So they actually cross. There we go. That's much better. And this time, again, what do you find? You find that the asymptote is x equals 0. This time, the domain, the domain is going to be what? The domain is going to be that x is an element of real values for x is greater than 0. And the range is that y is going to be an element of real values. I'm really sorry about why I'm struggling with that drawing. I don't know why I struggled. Okay, so do you see that you can easily draw the inverses of exponential graphs, especially if you get given the graph paper? Now, let's do some exam questions. Okay, and these exam questions are based on all the types of inverse functions that we're being given. So let's have a look at them. It says, a sketch of the hyperbola f of x, okay, and this is f of x there and there, okay, is given where x, you've got f of x equals x minus d over x minus p, where d and p are constants, is given below. The dotted lines are the asymptotes, and it says asymptotes intersect at p, okay, and b equals to zero. So they're saying that they cross at b and that b is to zero. Now, what do they say? First of all, it says find, determine the values of d and p. Find the values of d and p, but that p is not the same as this p, right? So we have an hyperbola that says f of x 
is equal to x minus d over x minus p. That doesn't look right, does it? Okay. Um, I'm just having to think. Usually the formulas work like this. It works out to be a over x minus x plus minus something plus or minus something. Um, and the fact that it's like this, you know what, grade 12, I'm actually going to come back to this question. I think that's the typo. I'm going to come back to it and I will do it in the next lesson and I'll check to see if that's a typo. If it's not, great. But if it is, then I'll fix it and then I will carry on with it in the next question, in the next paper. Oh, hang on. There you go, you see. So it is, is a bit of a typo. Yeah. Okay, so let us come back to that. Let's do this question. It says, the diagram below shows the graphs of f of x equals a of x. Okay, so this is f of x over here. Okay, and g of x is bx squared. So the parabola, which we're going to color green, is equal to bx squared. Okay, so it says the point P is one and a half is the point of intersection of F and G. Now, first of all, it says calculate the values of A and B, and that's fairly easy to do. So let's get stuck in with that. The first thing that we're going to do is just rewrite for ourselves. So we've got F of X is equal to A to the X, and that is for F. But we know that this point works, right? So we know that when X equals one, Y equals a half. So we can say when x is 1, y equals a half. So we can go 1 equals a to the half. Do you agree? So then what can we do? We can, okay, that's one way of doing this. x is 1, y, uh, let's try again. Oh, I'm moving a blonde there. When x is 1, y equals a half, okay? So when x is 1, y equals a half equals a to the 1. Therefore, we can say a is obviously a half, right? So therefore, we've got that a is a half. Now we need to work out our parabola. But we know that g of x is equal to bx squared. So therefore, again, this is the x value and this is the y value. So we've got a half is equal to b times by 1 squared. So b is equal to a half. There you go. So that is the a and b are a half. That's a half and that's a half. Nice and easy. Right, now it says explain why the inverse of g is not a function. The inverse of g is not a function. So if you look at the inverse of g, remember that you're swapping your x and y values and you are basically solving for y again but the g is a parabola so what happens is you get a new parabola this is a happy parabola so you're going to end up with a new parabola that does this okay that's what your new parabola is going to do and that is obviously not a function because one of the definitions of the function, one of the easiest ways to choose to prove if something is a function or not, is to be able to do a vertical line test. So if we draw a line which is supposed to be vertical through the graph and it cuts the graph more than once, then it is not a function. So therefore we can say, well, the inverse of G is obviously not going to be a function because it will fail the vertical line test. Another way of saying it is that in order for something to be a function for every x value, there can be only one y value. And if I solve for it, okay, we know that G of x is equal to a half x squared. Now that's what we know. So therefore we say that y is equal to half x squared. But now if we want to find the inverse, we swap the x and y. So it becomes x is equal to a half y squared. So therefore we've got 2x is equal to y squared. Therefore we can say that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2x. Okay, so do you see that for every x value, there's more than one y value? Let's do an example. We can say let x equal 1. Then do you agree that y is going to be either plus the square root of 2 times 1, or y is going to equal minus the square root of 2 times 1? And that is not 
a function. A function for every x value, there's one and only one y value. Now it says, okay, I just want to erase some of this. It says, write down two ways in which we can restrict um, the domain of g in order that g negative 1 is a function, and it's the inverse of g is a function. Okay, so they're saying how can we change or restrict g, the actual g. Okay, so we're actually going to mess with the original equation graph. We're going to look at g and we're going to say how can we rest restrict g, the domain of g, so that its inverse is a function. Okay, so domain, remember the domain is how far it stretches across the x-axis, okay? It's how far it stretches across the x-axis. So if I said, let's let um, g of x equal a half x squared, but x has to be greater than zero. Do you agree that I will only get this half of the graph? Okay, because that's the only bit of the graph where x is greater than zero. Okay, and then when I find the inverse, I'm going to end up only with this part of the graph which amazingly is a function because that is one line that will say that for one, every one x value, there is one and only one y value. Or, or I can say, let x be smaller than zero. If I say let x be smaller than zero, what happens? I end up with this dude here, this part of it here, which is the same, well, is in the inverse of this part of the graph. Okay, this part of the graph is the inverse of that bit there. And do you see that that's a function because for every x value there's one and only one y value. So whenever they ask you to look for restrictions to make something a function, you're always looking to restrict the original graph. Okay, you're always looking to restrict the original graph. Please be careful about that. You don't restrict your inverse. Right, now it says determine f negative 1, the inverse of f in the form y is equal to. Aha, so here is where our logs come into play. Okay, right. So, I need a different color. We're going to have, we know that f of x is equal to a half x. No, wait, try again. It's got a half to the power of x. But that is the same as y. But now, how does this work? Okay, let's write it the other way. It's a half to the power of x is equal to y. Okay, so we want to find this. So what do we do? We swap x and y and then solve for y. So it becomes, swap x and y, big solve for y. So it becomes, so the easiest way to remember this is 2 to the 3 equals 8 becomes log 8 base 2 equals 3, okay? So we're going to swap x and y. So we're going to say that's a half to the y is equal to x. So it becomes log x base a half. That's not right. to the second is equal to y. No, it is right. There you go. Half to log x base a half equals y. There you go. Moving on. Now it says, what is the f equation? It says, what is the equation of h of x, the function of g of x symmetrical about the y-axis? Hmm. Okay, so let's just draw a graph. Okay, it says draw. Okay, so let's just draw g of x. G of x is g of x is a quarter to the power of x. Okay. So what are we saying? We're saying if we just had to plot some points x and y and we say 
minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. Okay, if x is minus 2, what do you get? You get 4 to the negative x. Okay, that's what we're actually plotting. So x to the minus 2 is going to be 4 to the minus minus 2, which is 4 to the 2, which is 16. So we're saying that that's 16. When x is negative 1, we've got 4. When x is 0, we've got 1. When x is 1, we've got a quarter. When x is 2, we've got a sixteenth. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying when x is minus 2, so let's just get this. Okay, when x is minus 2, minus 1, okay, minus 2. And guys, I really suggest that you guys do this type of thing, especially when you start doing these graphs, so that you can get an idea of where you are with the graphs, and it really gives you a feel for what is happening. And then remember that the points on your x-axis have to be more or less equidistant, and the points on the y-axis have to be more or less equidistant, but they don't have to have exactly the same um, scale. So in other words, if I've got minus 2, one, minus 1, 1, 2, this doesn't have to go 1, 2. It can actually go 2, 4, 6, etc. Except I want to go up to 18 and my next one's a 4, so I'm actually going to make these in 4s. So I'm going to say, okay, that this is 4, 8, 12 and remember this is a rough graph okay so for me the rough graph means i do not need to use rulers for you a rough graph means that you don't have to be exactly perfect and there's no graph paper you still need to use a ruler to draw your grid lines okay and you still need to draw it in a pencil and use an eraser to fix all your errors okay so when x is minus 2 this is 16 when x is minus 1, this is 4. When x is 0, y is 1. When x is 1, it's a quarter. And then it's a 16. So it's a very steep graph. Okay, right. Happy. Okay, and this is g of x. Now it says, what is the equation of h of x, the function of g of x, about the y-axis. So what would that look like before we even talk about it? Do you agree that it would look something like this? So it's going to be going up like this, and then it will be going when x is 1, y is 4, and then when x is 2, y is 16. So it's going to look like this, okay? So what is the difference? The difference is that the x is chain sign. Okay, the x is chain sign. So the whole value, the y value stayed the same, but the x value has changed. Okay, so in other words, when now when we have x is minus 2, no, when we've got x equals 1, we're getting, so do you agree that I could rearrange this as 4 to the negative x? Okay. That's 4 to the negative x. But this time, what has happened? The x is now positive. So therefore, this is going to be written as, it would be written, what is the function of h of x? h of x is going to be 4 to the x because it's now that the x is positive. Okay, do you understand? Yeah, this is negative. Okay, yeah, we're saying when x is 1, y is 4. 4. When x is 2, y is 16. The only way that can work is if you've got 4 to the 1 is going to be 4 and 4 to 2 is equal to 16. So therefore it's the positive version of this and therefore it's f4 to the x. Right, grade 12, we've run out of time so I'm going to never need you. I'm going to check that hyperbola equation and we'll come back to it. I'll do it on the next slide and we'll finish going through this question tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Thank <laughs> you.